All right, welcome back to AI4 2021. I hope you're enjoying yourself so far. Our next speaker is Ray Diot. He is the Chief Data Officer, Global Healthcare and Life Sciences at NetApp. Please join me in welcoming Ray to our virtual stage. Thanks, Patrika. It's great to be here. So today we're going to talk about the real promise of AI in healthcare. Uh, as Patrika said, I'm Ray Diot. Uh, I thank you for joining us today and I look forward to this session. So as you probably saw, we're going to talk about, you know, the great promise for AI in healthcare and the current focus on clinical care. Um, but there's a lot of roadblocks and there's a long road ahead for clinical AI. Um, however, we'll find a great adoption for AI uh, and great purchase on the administrative and operational side of the business. And so my, my, my thesis for this discussion, and I hope you'll agree with me by the end of it, is that the real promise for AI and healthcare today is in making the business of healthcare more efficient and more effective. And so we can trans, <clears throat> we'll, we'll transform the, the focus of, of AI and healthcare from the clinical domain into the business domain. At the end of the day, I hope that you walk away with understanding a real high level description of the current uh, state of AI in healthcare, a, a demonstration of where some of the low hanging AI fruit exists in healthcare. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, obviously. And then I want to give you a roadmap for where uh, AI can go in, in healthcare. So, some of the newsworthy AI use cases in healthcare all focus around the clinical side of the house. You know, coming from a healthcare organization, a, a large IDN here in the Midwest, uh, where I was chief data officer, lots and lots and lots of focus on clinical and looking at hospital-borne infections and doing risk assessments and real-time analysis, trying to understand who is most vulnerable to these, uh, these hospital-borne infections and other disease states that might cause a high-risk um, assessment, and trying to get those involved in, in workflows and really um, focus on better outcomes for patients while they're in the hospital. We see a lot of work in diagnostics, especially around radiology and cardiology. And with the uptick in COVID uh, and other diseases, uh, we see a lot of focus on, you know, trying to augment the radiologist, trying to augment the cardiologist, trying to augment the neurologist in getting into a better, more uh, complete or a faster or more accurate set of diagnoses for uh, for any of these disease states. Got a lot of focus on patient risk assessment, understanding, you know, the, the reoccurrence of people in the EDs and understanding their length of stay and focusing on how to make those frequent flyers uh, less of a risk for themselves and less of a risk for them, their, um, the systems that they're, that they're going to. We see a lot of push in research lot of, of focus up and down the omics chain from genomics to phenomics and everywhere in between and integrating each one of these to better understand how diseases are created, how they evolve and how they manifest in people. And AI is a perfect uh, tool for doing this work. To build on that, you start getting into precision medicine and precision therapeutics and building up these medicines that are very much one-off and focused on what is ailing the patient today based on the genetics of the disease and the genetics of the individual. And you're seeing a lot of disease diagnostics, right? How do we better identify earlier those diseases? So this differs a little bit from the clinical side of the house where AI is very much focused on building diagnostic patterns and looking at the omic stack and looking at all of the breadth of picture to build templates to identify early diagnostic markers that can then be moved into the clinical setting. Okay, so why do I say, I mean, if there's all of this hype around uh, AI in the clinical space, what's wrong with it? Why is my thesis that the clinical side of the house is not necessarily where the real impact of AI can be felt today. Well, there's nothing-ish 
wrong with clinical AI today. There's great promise for AI in the clinical space. But healthcare is a very large space. Clinical is big, it's shiny, it attracts a lot of attention, but it isn't all of healthcare. There are lots of problems to solve in this space. There are almost too many, too many problems to solve in this space because each one of these solutions has to be built nearly one-off. Some There is some replicability, but depending on how data is formed, depending on how AI is deployed in organizations, it takes a lot of time and a lot of confidence to build up AI in the clinical space for it to be adopted and used to greatest efficacy. Eventually, clinical AI and AI augmentation or AUGI or, and biosilical collaboration with providers and patients and algorithms, it's going to dominate the way that care is delivered. But today, we just haven't seen the adoption. Even our biggest EHR vendors are reticent to put any major stock in their AI tools and, and are providing uh, fiscal compensation to organizations to use those and to help them suss out all of the problems that they're having with some of those AI tools that they're trying to provide at a platform level. Today, clinicians and, and patients just don't have the evidence to put their faith in mechanized healthcare because we, AI practitioners that is, haven't addressed the space adequately to establish a basis of trust with these uh, practitioners and patients. Now, that's not to say we're not doing good work. That's not to say AI is not where it's gonna be. AI is where we are going for all things that we do in every industry, especially in healthcare. But why aren't we seeing the adoption that we think we should be seeing? Because AI is so cool and has so much power and so much potential. Well, we have to deal with regulation, whether it's FDA here or EMA in Europe. We have to deal with that. We have to deal with the people part of it and getting around belief and belief that you know AI is somehow bad or it's somehow a, a turning over of control to a machine. And that's not it at all. There has to be a foundation built around fact, around how AI can be leveraged in the clinical space to garner that adoption. It's about building trust, right? Clinicians are built around knowledge. They're built around trust and building trust with their patients. And we just haven't done enough work yet to establish that trust between AI and the clinicians and the AI community and clinicians. We're getting there. We're doing fantastic work, but we're not quite there yet. There's a fear of replacement, right? And, and, and we hear this from clinicians all the time. They don't want to be replaced by a machine. They, they're scared of their jobs. We hear this actually not just in healthcare, but in all tons of other industries where we get robotic process automation and the robots are going to take over. There is truly a fear of replacement. And part of that is we need to demonstrate the augmentation power of AI to clinicians. And where I'm going to go with this is that we, we get to the point where we can easily integrate into their workflow. Today, we struggle to do that right? The EHR is the nexus for all things care delivery. But most EHRs are a closed ecosystem. They're hard to break into. It's hard to get the data out and push the insights back into them in an effective, timely manner that clinicians can use to administer care. We have to worry about data avail availability and consent back to the EHR discussion, but also looking at the entirety of the data ecosystem within the healthcare community. It's disparate, it's siloed. It's hard to get to on the clinical side of the house. And frankly, we should be asking for consent from our patients as we start to build up some of these models and leverage their data in a much more open and honest and transparent way than I think the healthcare community has done in the past. But with that, we haven't seen greater adoption because we, we do struggle with lack of consistency and accuracy and precision. We have some models that do fantastic and they discover amazing patterns and they push great insights into the field. But then we have others that are no better than flipping a coin. And we need speed. We need to be able to develop and field these things faster so that we can get that adoption. And I said it already, I'll say it again. 
because most of the clinical use cases are one-offs and they're done by system, system by system or hospital by hospital or worse, disease state by disease state, it takes time to deliver them. So where's the low hanging fruit? What's the real promise of AI in healthcare today? How do we get over some of those hurdles? How do we get into the place where we can talk to greater adoption on the clinical side of the house? How do we push into healthcare effectively with AI at the enterprise level and not just individual projects that focus on radiology or cardiology or neurology or, or surgery? We start with that low hanging fruit. And we look where we've seen success with AI in healthcare. And guess what? It happens to be where we have overlap or similarity with other industries. And guess where that is? It's in the back office. It's in the way that we execute the business of healthcare. It's how we operate our hospitals. It's how we operate the system and how we look at the administrative tasks that surround care delivery. Right? These tasks, the tasks of the CFO, the tasks of the CHRO, the tasks of supply chain are all tasks that are replicated outside of healthcare. And guess what? We've done a fantastic job in the AI community of bringing solutions to bear in those areas. If we can take those low-hanging fruit and borrow from other industries and bring those platforms into healthcare, to start talking to rev cycle management and understanding how we're pulling revenue out of the workflow, getting it into a place where we don't have herds of human beings making phone call after phone call and annotating chart after chart after chart and bringing together AI, robotic process automation, uh, workflow optimization, all of these other AI powered capabilities starts making the business of healthcare run smoother. We can talk to claims and claims management. There are teams of people, sometimes hundreds of people at, at IDNs, large integrated delivery networks in healthcare that do nothing but check on the status of claims. Well, why don't we replace them with a machine and allow those people to do other work? By bringing AI to bear, on these lower hanging fruit like rev cycle, like claims, like supply chain, which we'll talk about in just a second, we can actually start building a foundation of trust and belief that AI can be powerful, that it can be augmentative, that it can bring great benefit to the business of healthcare and subsequently to the clinical delivery side of healthcare. It helps us build a foundation. When we talk about supply chain, I can't tell you how many inefficiencies I've seen in supply chain delivery, whether it's logging of gear, whether it's distribution of supplies, whether it's ordering of supplies, it's still very manual. It's still very much based in Excel and paper charts. There are so many ways that we can bring advanced analytics and AI to bear on supply chain problems that start building up that trust and belief and start really streamlining the way that we execute the business of healthcare. Staffing and HR, you know, there's a huge problem with churn in healthcare, both on the patient side of the house, but also on the staffing side of the house. And 30% and of nursing staff to churn a year is not uncommon. So being able to identify those potential problems or issues or churn points that we have in the system, or identifying those people who are likely to stick around longer actually brings down the cost of executing the HR mission and objectives in a business. When we talk about finance, getting into a predictive and prescriptive realm of executing the business's finance, knowing where we're gonna be and how we're gonna get there is very much an AI problem to solve. Right, it, it, it's, a, it's a problem that is done exceptionally manually. It's done with a lot of BI and very unsophisticated tools with a lot of people driving it behind it, driving behind all of those tasks. Bringing AI in and bringing automation to bear on the finance side of the house actually gives a clearer picture of what's going on in the business and can help drive both top and bottom line revenue. When we talk about strategy and how are we going to do 
mergers and acquisitions? How are we going to build centers of excellence? How are we going to drive the future of the system? AI is perfect for that and other advanced analytics techniques. And when we talk about pure operations, right? What workflows are best or optimal? What processes need to be changed? This is another place where discovery, where um, the dis power of discovery of AI, the power of execution of AI can really be brought to bear on the back office. And again, these are all low hanging fruit. These are all areas where other industries have been able to leverage AI, leverage other non-traditional AI techniques to really drive the efficacy and efficiency of the business and build a platform of trust around mechanization of their business. And it's my belief that if we can do that, if we can really focus on establishing trust, building a good belief cycle that's based on fact, that's based on empirical evidence of the way that we've brought AI to bear on the back office, the clinical side of the house will come next and adoption will go through the roof. And all of those great big problems that we all wanna solve as we start talking about patient lives and saving lives and impacting lives and doing good for our communities can actually start growing in adoption. They can actually start being bolstered by AI and the tools that we know can help the community. So what do we bring to bear on the back office? We can look at traditional AI and look at supervised uh, learning techniques, right? There's tons and tons and tons of well-organized data and trends that have been curated for decades in health systems. They can be used to train models to do anything from predictive to prescriptive analytics to risk assessment and you name it. There is tons and tons of that data that can be thrown into supervised learning platforms and can really drive that adoption. We talk about unsupervised and bringing that unstructured and structured data together and identifying behavioral behaviors, identifying trends, finding patterns that we couldn't find before through traditional BI techniques. This helps drive strategic decision-making on how we operate the business, on how we execute our strategic plans and objectives and build roadmaps for the next five, 10, 15 years of the operation of healthcare, right? But without unsupervised learning techniques, we can't ever get the, the data is just too massive and too broad in variety for us to do it manually. When we get to reasoning and talking about NLP and vision and video, they can help in areas like compliance, in cyber, in IT, in supply chain. And we can start building decisions that are augmented, leveraging machine reasoning, leveraging that biosilical collaboration that we so desperately want to get to on the clinical side of the house, but can't yet get there because we haven't built the foundation. Well, here we can build a foundation of that collaboration. We can talk about non-traditional AI, and I use quotes there for, for a reason. These are non-traditional techniques, but they are very complementary to those supervised and unsupervised and reasoning techniques that we hear about in AI all the time. When we talk about workflows and process analysis in healthcare, there's too little multivariate optimization that's performed. There's too much data, but the tools have not been brought into healthcare. There are many, many industries that have adopted optimization practices that have streamlined the way that organizations run. And, and, and it could benefit healthcare tremendously. We talk about modeling and simulation. One thing I found as an IDN CDO is that there are far too, too few tools to explore possibilities. And there are too many decisions that are being left to incomplete analysis. The ability to what if scenarios to explore thousands or millions or billions of permutations on the business brings modeling and simulation together with supervised and unsupervised learning and other reasoning techniques and optimization to build an entire stack of tools that can help streamline the way that we operate the business of healthcare. Bringing this, building the foundation on the back end and bringing this concept of this wonderful cacophony of tools to bear on the clinical side of the house can only be done by doing it on the business, by showing what can be done and how it can be done and how it can be trusted. 
as we move forward and then getting into things like game theory, as we talk about what ifing, as we talk about modeling and simulation, but bringing all of these things together, it's not which class of AI, which I think we focus on a lot in the clinical side of the house, right? Oh, I wanna focus on this deep learning. I wanna focus on this convolutional neural network. I wanna focus on this K-means clustering to identify some patterns. If we bring a holistic view of all of the classes of AI advanced analytics together, we can actually build up a very robust foundation to change the landscape of the way that we deliver care and healthcare. So if we do this on the back end, how do we benefit healthcare? We, talk, we immediately start hitting bottom and top line revenue of the organization. We manage efficiency and efficacy, whether it's how people are managed or how processes work or how clinical care can be delivered from how the clinic operates, right? How do we check people in? How do we notify them of their upcoming appointments? How do we ensure that they're showing up? All of these are AI problems that then affect the bottom and top line revenue by bolstering efficacy and efficiency, by supporting clinical delivery, whether it's looking in the pharmacy and, and trying to minimize wastage and increase compliance in the way that drugs are delivered. Patient care management, right? I talked about reaching out and touching and making sure patients get to their appointments. Those are all chatbot things that we can do. They're AI solutions that we can do. They're RPA things that we can bring to bear. And they're all on the backside. But what they do is, is they bring about delivery today and start establishing that proof of trust and can help drive clinical adoption as we move forward. We can get to less patient and associate churn by bringing AI to bear on the back end of healthcare. And for the patient, all of these things matter, right? Making sure that they're seen only as much as they need to be seen. Making sure that they're seeing who they should be seeing and why. But effectively managing their journey through the healthcare system is truly a job for AI. And it's not on the clinical delivery side. It's on the way that they interact with the system itself. So what's the roadmap? Really high level. It's all about identifying those pain points. Where is the business struggling today? And we can talk to hundreds of use cases of where IDNs are struggling with places of, you know, finding finance, of making margins, right? The average margin pre-COVID was less than 3% a year in healthcare systems, which is almost unsustainable. Most organizations are in the red every year and after COVID, it's even worse. It's then identifying the low hanging fruit of those pain points, right? Then driving incremental delivery. Nothing says trust, nothing says believe me more than delivering incrementally, more than showing value at every step of the journey. Because then you get incremental adoption. You get adoption from your business, and guess what? There are clinicians who work with that business who will see the change, who will feel the change in the way that their practices run, in the way that their supplies are delivered, in the way that their variation drops because of the way that the back end runs. You'll get that adoption. And from that adoption, you'll be able to build community around that. You'll be able to build communities of analysts, of operators, of administrators, and then of clinicians that ultimately understand the utility and value of what you're bringing to the table with AI and AI adoption at the organizational level. And you establish that trust. And now you can start delivering on the promise of health of AI in the clinical domain in healthcare. So yeah, eventually the promise of clinical care enhancement with AI is enormous, but we're not yet there today. Today, the promise is in making healthcare run better and leveraging that practice to establish a foundation for clinical AI and clinician augmentation by developing trust, by developing belief, and developing cooperation and collaboration between man and machine across the entire enterprise. And with that, I'll say thank you and hope that you'll visit us at netapp.com AI to learn all about what we're doing to help enable and empower AI across every industry, especially healthcare and life sciences. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. That was amazing. I know this virtual audience is going wild with virtual applause. <laughs> Thank you so Hopefully. much for sharing with us today. Yeah. <laughs>
All right, for welcome. the audience. For the audience, it's time for you to make your way to your next session. Along the way, make sure you accept your connection request and take some time to check out our amazing exhibits. Thanks so much, and we'll see you around.